at 10 o'clock, Rita Chakrabarti will be here with a full roundup of the day's news. First, though, it's an industry that has undergone many changes and continues to evolve. But is local radio still truly local and relevant in Britain today? Let's take a look at the medium that was once affectionately known as the village loudspeaker. A large number of presenters and staff will no longer be required. It's quite a sad situation around the country. The word local is being taken out of, of, of local radio. That person you listen to is your best friend. DJs and the radio industry have united in their shock and disbelief. It is the media cockroach. Everyone said it's going to die and it just keeps going. Well, over the last decade, studios across the region have closed. That niche that local radio held has probably gone. The headlines. Lancashire's oldest commercial radio station is to close its studios in Preston. There are people who probably have no idea what local radio really is now. Local radio means it's the station from where I live. I think that makes it really special because we focus on what's going on around us. You won't make great radio unless you break the rules. The boss will never tell you you're good. The bosses know nothing about radio. Playing the same records over and over. Just about everybody does that here. If you cannot punctuate great music with great local content, you may as well just plug in an iPod. Oh, of course it matters. It's about bringing a community together. Community radio will be it if it's given a chance. We have come totally full circle. It's just a unique one-to-one -one relationship. We were the, the uh, loudspeaker of the village. When local radio started, it was focused on the people, the areas and the community it served. But it's Capital Radio Day! But since then, the industry has undergone a massive evolution, especially in the commercial sector. Once proudly local stations now broadcast the majority of programmes from network centres, with the localness and range of programming scaled back. But were the changes to be expected? In 1973, just before the first local commercial stations arrived, the BBC arranged for three of the biggest stars of radio at the time to make their own predictions. Nearly five decades later, we've caught up with them again to see if they were right. Well, last week the BBC announced the summer schedules on radios one and two, one of several steps in preparation for the arrival of local commercial radio to this country within the next few months. We were fairly accurate in terms of our predictions as to what might happen. Kit Jensen has flown over from the Grand Duchy and Johnny Walker has driven all the way from Ealing to discuss this. I recall predicting what I thought the future of radio would be and I talked about uh, the narrow casting of uh, broadcasting. A lot of people put down like pigeonholing of music um, and you shouldn't say this as that, but I think it's right for a person who's in a particular frame of mind. One day we could even have six stations in London. Do you think we could arrive at a situation though where we get maybe a choice of half a dozen stations in London? Do you think that's a possibility? You mean like one station programming R&B and one station catering for jazz? Yeah, I, I guess I got a little bit of that right. Do you find your freedom of choice limited, John, with the music that you... Well, I, I, I don't do. choose any of the records on my program. Mm -hmm. um, they're all decided by a panel of executive producers. I was allowed to suggest a record for my producer to take to the meeting. No DJs went to the meeting. I wanted to be on a playlist panel or something like that, but uh, I think people were mistrustful of that. They saying, what does he want to be in, the, in those meetings for? The idea of Im Im imposing some kind of playlist or some kind of sound, uh, you know, to target some kind of audience that you feel might be receptive to what it is you're doing, is not a bad idea. So who's qualified to, to choose the music for a radio Nobody, station? the people. The people who listen. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. And that's the danger. The executive but, producers stuck in, in London who don't travel around and meet the people and the advertisers deciding what the people want to hear. The problem in, with commercial radio is that they are always going to be beholden to the advertisers for, you know, sponsoring or advertising on the station. And, uh, you know, there's ways and means that, and the politics of the way things go of the station playing music it doesn't necessarily believe in. I personally am looking forward to the advent of commercial radio um, because you tend to get very stagnant. Radio 1 really did take seriously the competition that was now gradually arriving from commercial radio. There were two strands of local radio. There was the BBC local stations, of course, of some of which had already been up and running for a little while. BBC local radio was a completely different animal. We were trying at BBC Radio Leeds in those days to do a local version of the Today Show. And you would do a round table discussion with four councillors talking about, you know, ring roads or whether you were going to have a rapid transit system in Leeds. It was very, very local. The other was the ILR, the independent local radio stations, which uh, often had more of an aggressive sell. 
I was working in the late 70s for a station called Radio 210, started by this eccentric talent spotter called Neil French Blake. The response was fantastic from the what you would call the working classes. It was so funny too because the station used to close down at one o'clock at night and every now and again Steve and I would go in and sort of play music in the middle of the night. <laughs> I mean you'd never be able to do stuff like that these days. There was also another strand of local radio which was incredibly local where one of Capital's early presenters got his first break. It was a radio station for the people who were doing these fairly mundane jobs so the staff turnover rate was immense and United Biscuits had the idea of, of trying to stop that turnover. They installed 500 loudspeakers in just one of their 12 factories. And the radio station worked. And then after nine months, uh, I heard about a possible vacancy where I live, which was London, on Capital Radio. Capital Radio. When I said to my friend who was there, I said, oh, I pity the poor so-and-so who has to take over from Kenny Everett. Can you imagine? A month later, it's me. Right, album track. This is Musical Youth. I began with them about a year and a half into its life. They had money troubles. Uh, luckily, our chairman was a certain Sir Dickie Poo, as Kenny used to call him, Richard Attenborough. Lovely, lovely man. He was able to keep us on air. Then we have the cartridge machine over here. Courtesy of Brown Wolf and the Flying Eye. Good morning. It used to be known as a full service radio station because we had a bit of everything. We did the vet, the doctor, the, the gas man. Flat share. I think we invented eBay. We did Tradio or the Morning Market. The minute you played the Tradio jingle, the lines were full. If anybody had a problem, we would try and help them sort it out. We all used to hate doing furry friends, but it was in the clock and you had to do it. The proposition was that we're from your area. To be honest, we all used to hate doing Watsons because we thought it sounded a bit nonky. We are part of your community. Get engaged with us. And that message was heard loud and clear. People loved it. These were just great segments that were an appointment to listen, which I think is perhaps lacking these days. I honed in on Radio Air because I tried ringing my local radio station and I could never get through to the actual DJ. There was always a phone operative, whereas I think Radio Air, they weren't flash with cash, so they didn't have many phone operatives. So I always got through to the DJ so I could speak to the actual person that was on. Hello, the North and the Midlands calling. <coughs> All my broadcasting life, you were rated as, do you work on local radio or do you work on national radio? And of course, if you weren't on national radio, it's just not as good as, is it? You know, this rather kind of dismissiveness of local. He is in fact self-employed and he comes from Birmingham. The breakfast show of all things was presented by four different people on a rota, one week in every month. You can't establish a breakfast show by changing the presenter every week, but BBC Radio Birmingham did. But you don't actually perform yourself, do you? Yes, yes I do. Yeah. You put on records, yeah, are you a dis- No! Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Tell them exactly where it is that you work and who for. Uh, the BBC, so it's not commercial. <laughs> <laughs> Radio, Bur Radio Birmingham, I do the breakfast show. I thought, oh, I've got to be on BRMB. The independent radio personality is Les Ross. They got some great people on BRMB. Great, it was the days of, you know, we have to hang this on the personalities. BBC Local Radio had not amassed the same audience as commercial radio. It probably didn't have the same promotion for a start. For a long time, the management, we didn't know the listening figures. I am world famous in Birmingham. <laughs> Capital Radio bought the company and from then on, Listening figures suddenly were much more important. You know, um, I, I understood the, 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 the relevance of it all. Then in the 90s, for some listeners, local radio started to become less local. No station now does its own programming 24 hours a day. Nowhere in the world is that happening. We're not doing it in Gloucestershire. It's a question of pooling resources when you're off peak. I think radio can still be good radio, no matter where the presenter is and what they're talking about. They don't have to tell you about a local jumble sale. I think it all began to change in Bristol when I got involved in a medium wave station called Brunel Radio, which morphed into Classic Gold as the GWR group who owned it took over more and more stations 
around the country. Commercially successful and popular, GWRFM has a substantial loyal audience. One of the great things about Wiltshire Radio and then later the GWR group is we were always pushing the bounds of technology. All CD, all day. More snap, less crackle in your pop. We were the first station to put in computerised playout and that was featured on Tomorrow's World, showing how we linked four of our radio stations together. For instance, this evening I phoned up the Weather Centre and then recorded separate local forecasts onto the computers for Bournemouth and Reading. Severe gales affecting the south coast, making it a stormy night in Bournemouth. And mine? They should stay dry in the Reading area, but quite Oh, chilly good. Howard. <laughs> so, with this system, local news about the weather, travel, competition results, and even jumble sales in each town is actually controlled from the network centre. I think a lot of people try to blame the technology for the loss of localness and the loss of full service radio. I think that's wrong. The technology was going to happen anyway, but the market changed, the way people listen to the radio changed. Nice to see you down here. So what was it like to be at a truly local radio station where there were significant changes? We got the licence and we went on air May the 19th, 1975. And a very, very good morning, Plymouth. Today is the day. It's well and truly come. They tell me we're no longer rehearsing. I remember that first day because there were dozens of people walking all in and out and I was just doing the show. They tell me when they started this job, they said you'll be all alone. I've never had so many people in the studio in my whole life. One of the things I remember is the local BBC. They said, we can't ignore you. It's a very big thing. A new radio station. We're going to broadcast you for about three or four minutes. Would you do me a favour? Don't play a commercial for about the next five or seven minutes. <laughs> we have looked at the revenue which we need to make our station a viable proposition. Our chairman, Lord Morley, was a guiding influence to us all. What effect is your advertising revenue likely to have, do you think, on local newspapers? I believe that local radio, once it has carved out a place for itself, will be seen as complementary to the other media. What people overlooked, I think, at the time was that we weren't looking to get rich. But the station did quickly become a success, thanks to a few magic ingredients. You're going to be able to phone the station and express your view on the government or the council or uh, the local golf club. You will have a vehicle to say whatever you like within legal limits on the air and you will be heard all over Plymouth and South East Cornwall. Plymouth Sound's audience figures in the city gave it the highest market share of any local station in the country. At that time, we had presenters that all came from Plymouth. And it worked because we knew what we were talking about. We knew every road. We knew most people that owned stores and fish and chip shops and pub landlords. It was like Emmerdale in Ohio or Dibley. Ian Calvert, of course. Well, he, he was the naughty boy. I went down to Motley Plain. It was an electrical store. I remember on the corner. I can't remember the name of it now. And she said he won't advertise because he said nobody listens to us. So David said, right, tomorrow, everybody, as all presenters, we wished him a happy birthday. One of the top line presenters at Plymouth Sound and people adored him. We said happy birthday to so and so at so and so. Happy 50th birthday. Next day, he was inundated with calls. Didn't say it was your birthday, didn't say it was your birthday. The sales girl came back, said he can't believe how many people listen to Plymouth Sound. And he advertised from then on. Was he going to go over the line? Am I going to get a call from the radio authority because he said too much? And he always just pulled back at the time when you were reaching for the red phone to ring up and say, stop him. <laughs> I used to get threats and things like that. And one night somebody rang live on air and said, be careful when you leave the building tonight. And this is live on air. If there's anything going on, if, you, if you've got anything going on, like a, a car boot sale, a charity event, whatever, just come in. And so every Wednesday at lunchtime, reception would be packed. It went crazy. It was like pop star -ish stuff. And that's because they had, there was a figure there that played their music and they listened on the radio too. Those days are gone. There were some evenings where I would cover up the, the flashing lights of the phone um, <laughs> with a CD because I didn't want to take any more calls. And then you see the door light flashing and go out to reception and the police are there because people have rung the police to say they couldn't get through to Plymouth Sound to put a dedication on. I don't always remember that. <laughs> it wasn't like going to work. I never worked from 1975 until GWR sat me. The board decided to accept an offer uh, from GWR radio to, to 
to buy us. It was bottom line up. It was nothing to do with talent. If we could make this pay, do this, do that, it failed. Our great philosophy to be for the community, with the community and about the community would have stayed. That did not stay with GWR. It assets stripped and it brought in trained seals who would work cheap work, long shifts. You would find that people would come in that didn't really have a, a radio background, they were more of a business background and they would just see lively personalities around the offices saying, oh, they'd be good on the radio. Talentless, not their fault. They wanted to be in radio. Grabbing somebody from an office and sticking them on the breakfast show without any prior presenting experience is not good. The station became unrecognisable to those of us who had known it in the early days, yeah. And it didn't, well, I don't think it worked. Well, it clearly didn't because the ratings plummeted. With the new Plymouth sound on 97 FM. Choose the style that suits you best. I think it was the, the, the networking of the music. You were suddenly told, right, we've now got to stick to this. And so you would, you would have to. Everything was piped down. GWR was the antichrist of commercial radio. It was the total opposite of what we believed in. Well, I've heard all the arguments from people who want to tightly program radio stations that I heard back in the days when I was working at uh, Radio West and then Wiltshire Radio. And when they'd hire these guys from New Zealand or Canada or somewhere and bring in these tight formats and then the focus test songs over the phone with the focus groups and all of that. There'd be certain songs where you would just think, oh, no, not again. No, surely I only played that 37 seconds ago. People only listen to the radio for like 20 minutes or half an hour. Well, I used to listen to radio all day. A lot of my friends used to listen to radio all day and complain that the records were repeat. There's too, too few records repeated too often. We had a positioning statement we had to use from time to time. We don't talk over the intro of your favourite songs. So I would say that over the intro of a song and say, we don't talk over your favourite songs and I know you're not that keen on this one, so it's okay. Obviously the PCs would be there listening in the office and immediately be on the phone, you know. How dare you play Erasure when it should be Pet Shop Boys? What's the difference? Don't tell anybody, but I remember <laughs> once going to the other side of the studio while I was playing about three or four in a row and practicing my golf swing. When I was at Capitol in the later years, you start off with four in a row, no talking, and you're thinking exactly as Graham said, you know, well, they're not paying for me to be segueing records. There did come the day where I put on whatever record it was, I don't know what it was, and I disliked it so much that I immediately threw off the cans, the headphones, on the desk and turned the speakers down. I just didn't want to hear it. I used to get around it by saying, coming up after the break, I'm terribly sorry, but we've got Celine Dion. When it became more computerised and this computer system called Selector from America, that comes in, it starts to become a, a bit homogenized. Suddenly people were in the canteen were talking about, the, not that song again, when, when you would hear it through the house system. I have to be fair and say that the younger listener liked the music. The music that was played all day, all the time, they liked. The industry was changing just like it is today. The radio industry constantly has to evolve. And around that time, 88, 89, 1991, there was a real shift in the radio industry. And when the playlists came in, you'd get a lot of younger presenters saying, um, that was uh, Sade and Smooth Operator, and it'd be like, Sade! We listened for the music, we listened for the content, we listened for the chances to win, but ultimately we listened because we like the person who's on the air. They're the people you want to hang out with, and they're the people in the know, but they're not so far in the know, it's the know that you live. If that makes sense. I think it's very important to have a personality on radio. To justify right, to your somebody existence, play. I think, because an eight-year-old, it's very easy for an eight-year-old to go on and, and play records, right? There's so many radio stations who don't allow their presenters to develop a personality and they're very strict on how they present. It would say, page one, out of news, time check, read the weather. Page two, play two songs. People who say to me, I have to say, you know, mention the radio station, mention the time. Every link I've got to, you know, and there's very strict rules on how they present, but it's very difficult to develop a personality. The power of that radio station brand had to go first. There were plenty of people that, th I remember them doing it, picking up the line of cars, throwing them away, and doing what they would normally do. Isn't radio about more than a brand? Isn't radio, I mean, I can remember, before I got into radio, I was an air conditioning engineer in Sydney, Australia. 
If I was in the van with an apprentice, we listened to Triple M, rock station. If I was in the van on my own, I always, always listened to AM talk stations because I didn't want to be on my own. I love to listen to, to somebody on the radio who's genuine. You listen to them on the radio, they might make a mistake. They might stumble over the words. They might get something wrong. But it's human nature. You don't want everything polished to perfection all the time. Some local radio stations around the country, which used to have local heritage names, have been replaced by brands. So Heart and Capital and Smooth. And the thing about a brand is they put a lot of money into it. So the big companies behind it will put a breakfast show on with some national stars. So Jamie Thicks and Amanda Holden on the Heart Breakfast Show on local radio stations around the country. They're all clearly defined radio stations so it's like the tap. When you turn on a tap, you know water's going to come out of it. When you put smooth radio on, you know exactly what you're going to get. We've seen a lot of local radio presenters lose their jobs, and it's quite a sad situation around the country. When I left, when I did my last show, I'll, I'll never forget, actually, going out into the car park at 10, and there was a, a stack of listeners all there who'd come down to, to listen to my last link in the car park, which was lovely. And that was so sweet, and they'd all brought me cards and presents and things. So. That just shows that you connected with them, which is really, really sweet. A local radio programme has received a thank you card with a difference. The card was sent following the death of an avid fan called John. We hadn't heard from John for a while and it had been mentioned in the office. The card arrives, everyone met it with great sadness. It was a, um, you know, completely unexpected. He planned it that way and thanked BBC Radio Sonant's uh, Breakfast in Dorset show for all their programmes and local interest. And it just makes you reevaluate what you do and think we really do do something that really matters to people. There we are. It is now the John Martin studio. Somebody once described it to me as local radio, you're first in and you're last out and then you're still there when the story is going on and on and people are returning to it year after year. And I think the floods is a really good example of that. The event at Doncaster Dome has been organised by BBC Radio Sheffield. You can see the very handsome Toby Foster there. You have seen yourself firsthand some of the experiences by the people who've been affected by the flooding. How devastating was it? It was horrendous. We did a week of shows out there. It's just devastation. I mean, just you know, people are going to be out of the houses for months. The TV cameras may have gone, but the reality and the aftermath is still something people live through. And that's what local radio can give you that I don't think anybody else can do. I think one of the great changes in radio in the last five or ten years is the democratisation of it. Anybody can run a radio station now. It was an incredible launch because it was the first time commercial radio had ever come across the Tamar Bridge, of course. And after decades working for both commercial and BBC Radio in Cornwall, Duncan Warren has launched his own DAB station with his son. We've invested heavily in technology at the start, so um, we don't need a staff of thousands to, to help run the station. 56% of people in Cornwall now are listening on DAB. We have now become the, the main listening force. As we grow, our output will grow, there will be more presenters. Within months of being on air, Cornwall got to Twickenham in the rugby final in the Bill Beaumont Cup. We took a coachload of our listeners up there with us. That is one advantage we have got over national radio. They cannot do that. We can. This radio station is for people who work on sites, builders, tradesmen, painters, decorators, who have the radio on all day. And they have a higher, much, much higher time spent listening than people who work in offices. Which is why the building and the trades as a profession is the only profession that has a specific radio made for them. They make radios that are for sites, the site radio. This is Voice FM. We've probably got 300 community radio stations dotted around the country and the plan is for even more of those to appear. I think with community radio it's very much a different ball game to an ILR station because you're more or less reliant completely on volunteers. We focus on what's going on around us. We have a lot of guests. They're trying to raise awareness for issues around the community, local artists, and I think that makes it very special. Voice FM is fantastic because you look at the board, the board behind us I'm looking at now, there's just so many varied shows. There's a business show, there's a football show, there's our show. Lots of different people coming together, really varied. As you can probably tell, I have an accent. I'm from Portugal originally. I was really insecure and I said, I'm really self-conscious about my accent. Can I actually speak on air? And the person that was there with me like, oh, absolutely, that makes you unique, that's incredible. Voice gave me the opportunity to kind of grow and be more confident about myself, which I'm really grateful for. It's about bringing a community together, bringing the small names and the small voices out. 
That's what it's about. The problem with some community radio is that it's restricted in its funding. We need to be de-restricted, firstly. We need, if, if we're really not going to have any local radio other than community radio, we need to be de-restricted. If we could just go out there and earn our money and compete with the big boys on the same terms, then we would not only give them a run for their money, but we would provide an even bigger and better service for this area. I see any advertising money that we bring in as helping to support the local economy. Setting up and running Black Cat Radio, which I do with a team of directors, is probably the hardest thing I've ever done. I believe community radio is the new local commercial radio. The local station sold out to the big boys. The big boys are in it to make money. We're in it to make programmes, which is exactly where we started off back in the 70s. Radio is dead, long live radio. You know, 90% of people are still consuming radio in its various forms uh, at the moment. Hopefully radio will always have its place in people's lives. It's a magic medium. I still think it's magic. Local radio is hugely important. It must never be allowed to die. Do it as a hobby. Don't do it as a career because it is really, it's, it's almost soul destroying when, when you see these radio stations closed down. And now you've got people listening on DAB radios, listening on FM radios, smart speakers, listening on their mobile phones. That's great because radio is in more places than it's ever been. Radio's in great shape. It's just taken a long time to get to where it should have been regulated to be. What local radio can do that no one else can do, it can tell the story of where I live. Video didn't kill the radio star. We thought automation would kill the radio star. We thought networking would, but none of it has. Great radio is still great radio. And that's what it's all about.